Um, this is Elizabeth Townsend. This is um, July 13th. Um, we're here with Paula and Mary from the Career Services Center, and we're doing an interview. All right. Um, well, first, before we begin, why don't, I'm going to ask you, and each, how, what made you decide to go to law school? Oh, and, um, that far back. That far back, and just sort of, how, sort of, what made you decide to go to law school, and was it what you expected? So. Well, when when I decided to go to law school, uh, it was in the energy first energy crisis in the seventies, early seventies, and um, so environmental issues were big issues, and that's uh, that's really what kind of got me going and thinking about it. Plus, by the time I'd finished four or five years teaching in the public schools, I'd gone from making fifty eight hundred dollars a year to ninety eight hundred dollars a year. And I knew I had to do something different. What uh, did you teach in the public schools? Where? What? Oh, elementary. Hmm? Which grades? Oh, I, I was at a small school where I taught three, four, and five, and a mix. I've taught almost everything from one to five, and a little bit of, a little bit of middle school uh, thrown into. So. So how was law school after? Was it a big change? It felt pretty nice to spend all your time studying uh, as opposed to working. But it was a big challenge for me because I really wasn't prepared for what law school was uh, going to be involved uh, with. Uh, you all are much better prepared nowadays for uh, doing, I think, advanced uh, studies. But I, I didn't know anything about business which are accounting, any of those kinds of business and accounting type of concepts. When I went to college, you, you studied to be a teacher, and that was it. No. Um, and so did you go into environmental law once you got to law school? No, I really learned to love labor law. So that's, that's what I did, and I went to work for a labor union after law school, and uh, then eventually got into a litigation firm just doing general litigation. And what made you decide to come back to the law school, or into a law school environment? Oh, into an environment? Right. Well, um, after three years with a labor union and three years with a law firm, uh, an opening occurred at the University of Tulsa, and I thought it would be a good combination with uh, my education background and my interest in labor issues. So it seemed like a good fit, and they took a chance on me. And what did you do when you got there? What did I'm you doing do now? now? Yes. Plus okay. alumni relations, plus development. Um, and one more question, then we'll move on to Paula. Um, <laughs> what made you want to do career services? I mean, you said that it was labor, uh, that it was your combination, mm -hmm. but was there something specific that, I mean, did you know what you were getting into when you first started? And Not, not too much, other than the fact I, I give an example of what I did to students when they're going in and they're going to interview for something that they, they're they not sure that they're going to love or not, or they know anything about. I planned an entire year's activities of what I thought was involved with career services, and I interviewed the gentleman who was the current career services person and uh, came in with a whole plan, uh, and uh, I guess that was enough to sell them on it. And was your plan what you thought, it, I mean, did your plan match up to what you yeah. thought? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no relationship to the real world and what I thought the plan was going to be. And uh, Paula, how did you, how did you get here? Well, I really fell into law school. I have there are no attorneys in my family. I really didn't know any attorneys or what they did. But I, my background is economics, and I, at the time I was completing a joint economics MBA degree. And so I was working on the first year of, of my MBA and uh, happened to have a study partner who was married to a member of the College of Law faculty who said, you know, the way you think and the way that you're responding to these issues, you should think about law school. And so, you know, I walked next door. I talked with uh, Terry Holpert and at the time Barbara Atwood and learned a little bit more about what was going on at the law school and applied and, and fell in. <laughs> and was it what you expected? Did you have any expectations? I really didn't know what to expect, but I'll tell you what I found at law school. It 
fabulous experience. It provided for me an intellectual challenge that was so refreshing. Uh, I really loved all three years of law school. Uh, the, the classroom, the faculties, my interaction with the law students, it, uh, it was really an exciting period for me. So I had no expectations, but had I, it, it would have met them all. <laughs> and then what did you do once you finished? I did a clerkship for two years at the Superior Court. Uh, I worked for then presiding judge Michael J. Brown and came on at a really interesting time in Arizona's uh, development. Uh, we had just instituted new jury reform and really that's an area that uh, Arizona is leading the nation. While I was in law school I was on a jury and had an experience that wasn't the best for me so the way I actually met Judge Brown was writing a letter saying this system needs to be changed and he called me in and said you know if you really believe that now would be a good time for you to come to work for the court and so I joined his staff helped him do all of this CLE programs to teach attorneys around the state about the new system, uh, to talk to judges and to court staff about the new system. And then one of my main projects while I was at the court, uh, we wrote a grant and we received money from the State Justice Institute and the National Science Foundation uh, to conduct some really groundbreaking research on juries and how they deliberate and how they come about making their decisions. So. Uh, that kind of hooked me on court administration and some of the challenges that the courts face and I stayed on an additional five years uh, working as an assistant court administrator uh, supervising five or six major areas of the court. So really my career path after law school was very non-traditional. That's pretty interesting. And then what made you come back, come to the law school now? One of the things that I had been doing at the court and uh, really statewide for a number of the court systems was uh, training. I did a lot of training for court employees, uh, for administrators, and then uh, really for court administrators around the nation. And so I was very interested in the, the aspect of, of training and teaching. And one of the areas that I did a lot of work on was professionalism. And so when I saw that the, the uh, law school was looking for someone to come in and, in kind of a new role uh, to work with career services and to help uh, help communicate to law students what it really does mean to be a professional uh, and to help with training. It, it just seemed like a nice fit and I was also very impressed with the changes that the law school had been undergoing since I graduated. You know, in a, in a few short five years the growth and, and uh, the changes at the law school just showed me that we really we really have a dynamic institution. In, in what ways did you see? What kind of changes had did you see? You name it. <laughs> Going from hard benches <laughs> down in the lobby to you know wonderful cushiony uh, sofas uh, to redesigning the second floor, uh, moving out and making lots of new space for faculty, uh, to having new programs, to having Mary in Career Services, providing all of these wonderful resources, the web page, uh, the new dean, Tony Massaro, coming in with just a wealth of new ideas. Um, all of it, it really ran the gamut from small changes to, to the ones that I think you know are really huge and mean a lot to the law school. Was there someone here before you in your position, or were you the... You, oh, did no. You? No, they've, they've had someone in the position gosh, I'm sure, since the early 80s. And has it changed sort of what career services? It's such a big part of being in here. Um, mm -hmm. Has that, is that always been the case, or do you think that that's sort of Oh, it's grown? changed ra uh, radically uh, since uh, the early 80s. Really, career services uh, was not even a part of a law school until the 80s. Very, a few schools in the late 70s on the East Coast started with uh, career services, but for the most part, it's a new, fairly new phenomenon, early 80s, and uh, especially with web-based information and with computers, that's when everything just started going berserk. Why? Uh, because it was easier to Because it was computers. easier to share information, 
get information. It was more uh, reasonable cost. Keeping a library is very expensive. It's still very expensive to do. But uh, just the email list that we have of all the student classes, I can get jobs of special interest out in less than a minute mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, having you all have to look at a, a posting right. or something like that. So it's changed radically. Uh, I think Mary's being a bit overly modest also. That's why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> <For both of you. laughs> Let me just tell you, you know, I, I think that the technology and some of those things really have changed the face of career services, but uh, the students here at this law school, um, I'm not sure that they truly appreciate what what happens in career services. And I think where Mary excels, and you know, I'm trying to follow along in her footsteps because she really <laughs> does set a high bar for our office. But the amount of personalized service that each student gets in the career services office is very unique. Uh, every student can come in and meet not once, but you know, what, however many times it takes completely through the three years of law school and talk about their changing interests and you know, go out and experience a certain kind of a job and come back and talk about that. Uh, it's kind of a very evolutionary process mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, Mary makes it so personalized, it, uh, it really does excel. Having that experience from Mary for first hand, I think that's really true. Um, but I think what's also really interesting is sort of, and I know I haven't worked with you yet, um, so I haven't worked with you, but I imagine this, your style is similar. We've done a lot of things with these interviews because there are a lot of people trying to find their niche and sort of mm -hmm. what they like. And you spend a lot of time talking to students, at least with me, about really sort of trying to get at it. Um, and maybe we could talk a little bit about that because that seems to be sort of the essence of all of this. There's mm -hmm. so many things to choose from. And it's so hard, especially if you don't know anything, to come in with no expectations and you don't know what litigation is even and, and it's, you know, your second year and you're like, oh, the beginning of your second year and you have no idea what that means. Um, so maybe sort of talk about sort of the philosophy you have with mm -hmm. students and what they're, what this whole process is about sort of in a more philosophical space maybe. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about myself. I used to be so impatient with students when I first started in this. Not that I'm a model of patience now, but I used to be so impatient. It was like, I know what you want, just come on, come on. Uh, let me tell you what you want. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I realized one year, who knows how many years uh, it took, I suddenly realized, you know what? They know what they want. In their heart of hearts, they know what they want because they know what they like. And so it's a matter of taking enough time to listen and hear what they like and then for me as a counselor, and I know Paula does the same thing. She, however, was not impatient the way I was when I first started this business. Um, she, she came in with an innate ability to be able to do it. Then, then we throw out little nuggets of ideas and then when you see a student start to nibble on a particular idea, then you can take off in a, in a direction. And then it gives them more ideas. So that's, that's kind of the way um, it seems to be any way that I approach it. I think another uh, way that we're able to assist students is we don't work alone uh, with a student, although a lot of the work that we do is one-on-one -on -one and you know, over the course of a law student's uh, career here, we have the chance to really get to know all of the students. But we also have a wealth of resources in the legal community to help us. And by legal community, certainly the attorneys and you know, our graduates who are in Tucson, but with the World Wide Web, we're able to connect via email students uh, to alums all over the United States. And we've even had a telephone conference call from Bosnia. Uh, you know, bringing in a lot of attorneys to talk to students about what they do and what they like about what they do really just kind of enlarges the student's imagination and ability to put themselves kind of in the shoes of this person and that person. So you almost get a chance to kind of try it out and, and think about it 
um, without having to actually go out there and go through all of these different positions. I that's, think that helps. That's really the point of our programming that we do, is to throw these ideas out there for students and they can listen and say, no, that's not what I want to do, or gee, isn't that interesting? And I wonder how they got there, and then they can follow up with the speakers and different things. And it sort of seems like sort of a way to sort of imagine your life, that mm -hmm. sort of open your imagination, that, uh, that, that I don't think people realize that that's part of, that the law is going to just, there's just so many places you can go with it. It's one of the things, and we both firmly believe in that, that uh, you can do anything you want, absolutely anything. And uh, mm -hmm. so we're just here to help you find uh, what that might be. And it's really just a most of talking and then being, being able to be off onto different areas. Do you think students realize that? Do you think they get that message that there is all this out there? Or do you think that they still see it as like very like corporate job or, you know, that they see only these very small categories. Sure. I think they probably see pretty much just the small categories. Uh, I think if they talk to us though, <laughs> their world is going to broaden immediately because I don't think you talk to either one of us and get the idea that there's a very narrow path that you're going to walk in your legal career. Mm -hmm. they, they Almost always students are surprised at the different ideas that uh, come out of uh, this kind of a discussion. And, you know, bring a paper and pencil. Because really, as a student begins to get, get into this give and take of, of ideas and what they might do, it's kind of amazing that there just becomes so much to write down and to think about later and to follow up and, and to explore. Uh, it really is a wide world. I've experienced that. <laughs> Very good. And it's going to keep growing for you. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's the here's the big one. Grades. Yeah. How much do grades determine where you end up, and it, should people be as terrified of grades as they are? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, does it tell? Does it does it say that you're going to be at one? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. does it? It's it's kind of, uh, and I know how um, terrifying the thought, especially for the first uh, the, the law students just just started for the upper class students too terrifying Everybody. grades are. They are. They, <laughs> they, basically, your initial job can be determined somewhat by grades. As a general rule, the large law firms all over the United States hire from a fairly narrow strata uh, of the class say top 20% at the, at the U of A. And what's that, like GPA? Like GPA wise, yeah. that's probably year to year, class year to class year, but say it's probably 3.35 or, or 3.3 something like that, 3.4 mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. Th that's kind of a general rule. Every year I can show you an exception. I can show you the student who's a top 40% or, or top 50% right in the middle of the class who goes to work for one of those large uh, law firms. But I'm just kind of giving you right. just the general across the United States. So now, let's, okay. now, one thing to say though, uh, that's one particular employer that's available for you with a certain kind of a ranking or a GPA, but I was surprised when I services, you know, having so recently been a law student, you know, I sort of bought into the belief that if you don't have a certain level of a GPA, you know, you're stuck. You're going to have trouble finding a job. It's really going to be awful for you. Uh, I was surprised when I came here and realized that's not necessarily a predictor of how quickly you are going to find employment and how well you're going to like your employment. Isn't that true? Right. It's not a predictor of how soon you'll get a job. I was picking an example of one particular right. type of em employer. Right. Uh, but if you, if you look at the full range of employers, and one of the first things we did um, uh, when I got here was to say anybody can drop for any employer. You don't have to be 
if, if their uh, recommended criteria, preferred criteria is top 15%, I don't care if you're in the middle of the class, you can make your case and, and you have a background for it, you can certainly drop your materials uh, for that employer. Um, but there, once you get out into practice and you prove yourself, let's say you go out and you go the government route, mm -hmm. and you become an outstanding litigator uh, in government, then you decide to move into the private sector. Many times people can move into the private sector without the initial, uh, for the large law firms, without those initial uh, qualifying, mm -hmm. what they generally say is qualifying. But, but can I be truthful about one thing? Sure. The better you do, in law school, the bigger, the, sli the more slices of the pie you have to choose from. Now, I don't know whether that's a, mm -hmm. an, a fair thing to say or whether it's something, I mean, I do say it to students. Mm -hmm. So do the best you can in law school, whatever that is. I'm an example, she's an example of at the top of her class. I'm an example of the bottom half of my class. So, so it's, you can be, anywhere that you want to be uh, with with what you do. I like that. That's really and it's important. true. <laughs> yeah. That's really important. Um, and you know, the, the other thing that I learned in law school, uh, working uh, with one of my study partners, um, who is an incredibly talented person, uh, you know, has a PhD in psychology, has been uh, an official in the Arizona Psychologists Association, uh, she really thought and processed differently uh, than many of us in law school, uh, and her grades reflected uh, that she didn't quite fit in, in the norm uh, of the way to work through. Didn't have a thing to do with the quality of learning that she had or you know the kind of an attorney that she would be. So I think uh, I do agree with Mary to do the very best you can, but I think you know for those students who don't accomplish what they're hoping to with a specific uh, exam or a grade is to remain firm and convinced about their own abilities and what they're learning and what, it, what kind of an attorney they're going to be when they graduate. Uh, because things really begin to even out after you've been out of law school for a while, you know, what GPA that you got, it's really important in the beginning, but it's not necessarily the best indicator of, of how great of an attorney you're going to be or what kind of a, an impact you're going to have in your world. Well, okay. Did we answer your question? Yeah, you All did. Right. It was a good, it's a, it's a good <laughs> answer. Um, I think it's something that people really worry about. Um, attached to that is Law Review and, and Law Journal, and those people who don't get on it mm -hmm. think their lives are over. Mm -hmm. um, same thing? You're, you no, know, your life is much... Uh, no, your life is not over. Uh, your, your options are not... I think it used to even be maybe more important in years past uh, when the total law school population nationwide was much smaller. It was another way of, of uh, fewer number of people, fewer number of jobs. Now, uh, all law reviews and law and journals are, are such a small and limited number. There are so many excellent people mm -hmm. still within a class, and employers know that, that it's not um, as as critical at all. They look at it as that one more load that you're able to shoulder plus maintain good grades. The exception may be, uh, I would say, pretty much still are the members of the judiciary. If you want to be a law clerk for a judge, mm -hmm. especially in the upper level uh, courts, they look still very seriously at membership in, in law journal. So if you want a clerk in the federal system, uh, uh, United States District Court, Court of Appeals, or a state uh, Supreme Court, and if that's a goal of yours, then you should strive to uh, become a member of Law Review. Does it mean you won't get a clerkship if you don't? Absolutely not.
you just have to figure out other ways to show that you shine. Right, and the other ways that you show, you're on the moot court team, or uh, you're, or you publish, you do research, and you publish in other ways. They're looking to see evidence of your ability to write and uh, uh, be an advocate. All right, I'm gonna. Paula, do you have do anything to add? No, you think Go that's somewhere? Oh, okay. Um, Okay, I'm going to do a bunch of topics now. Okay. Um, let's start with the the um, the um, snobby jobs, the ones uh -huh. that, um, and we'll work to dip the different ones, but they so dominate the conversation in the sense that people right. are always measuring against that and then everything else, which seems to me kind of strange because it seems, it's just a funny way of measuring. Um, and I wanted to sort of know your opinion about that and also sort of how many of our students are actually getting these super high paying jobs okay. and, and what what is it? I don't know, how, how do you sort of factor that into the yeah. culture? Kind of thing? Let me just give you one example. I'm going to let you, uh, let you answer a little bit, but um, let me give you one example of the change in, in the big salaried jobs. Last year in the class of 2000, we had one student over $100,000. This year, uh, if my memory's right, over $99,000, we have like 12. Mm -hmm. or 13. That's in. That's a difference of one year. Yeah. Uh, and then Are another 12, 10 or 12 from the 90 to 99 range. So there's, there's, uh, that's an example just of the, the salary inflation that's occurred in the last two and a half years because it's been a major inflation. Now I can't remember what your question was. Well, really, my question but I is like that just dominates the, the sort Oh, of, and, and you know, know why it dominates it? It's because that's a lot of money. And so it's fun to talk about. Uh, gee, wouldn't that be fun to make that boy, I sure would like to work for Brown and Bain mm -hmm. and uh, make $100,000. I think that's the reason uh, it dominates the conversation. Also, Finding out inform and I don't know whether this makes sense or not, but finding out information about those larger employers is so much easier because they have websites, because they publish their information, because they publish their salaries, um, they support different mm -hmm. uh, job fairs, uh, minority job fairs, and other things. So their names are out there more. They're the ones in the news more, uh, at least in the East Coast. Uh, New York Times, East Coast papers. Those are the kinds, so you see it over and over. And they're the ones who know how many people they're gonna hire next summer for law clerks. So they're the ones who come on campus. The smaller firms may hire someone, but they're gonna wait until the spring to interview or to see how many people they may want. So you're bombarded with those names and that kind of knowledge really from the time you start law school. Part of our job is to get other options out in front. One of the things Paula's doing is working in the government sector. Uh, she just got back from DC. She had fabulous meetings with uh, Treasury, with the State Department, uh, just incredible one-on-one -on -one meetings with people. So how should students look at this? I mean, there's a sense of like, these are the golden people and the golden ticket and then everything else is like not as good. And I, I think that's really a bad way to go. I mean, I'm not sure, I mean, how do you think about, I mean, how much are people making if they're not making $100,000? Mm -hmm. And and how should they think about, I mean, and is, is that job good for everyone? That, that What does that $100,000, what's the price of that $100,000? Sure. I think one of the ways students get that information is, again, talking to folks in the legal community. And we, we have plenty of opportunities for students to do that. We have a mentoring program. Uh, we also have a number of close uh, partnerships and working relationships with the Dean County Bar Association and the Arizona Women Lawyers Association and the State Bar enough that if our, our students are talking to the people you know, who come in to present programs, what they're going to find is they're, they're going to get the opportunity to talk with people who are much more in the norm and who have a law practice that really is much more what the majority of attorneys are going to have 
And what they're going to find is that these people, and Mary can talk about what the average salaries are for you to get mm -hmm. that information, but what they're going to find is that these people have all created wonderful lives. They have challenging law practices, they love what they do, they're active in their legal community, you know, they have family, they have friends, uh, they're not necessarily, although some are, working at, you know, what, what did you call them, in the snob jobs, right. uh, but you know, by far more the norm is something different. Mm -hmm. And I think students have to keep their feet on the ground and keep that in the perspective. And only 15 to 20 percent of each graduating class uh, goes to work for the large law firm nationwide. That means 80 to 85 percent of the class is working for government, public interest, small and medium-sized law firms, corporations in both legal and non-legal, uh, the military, um, just academics, uh, getting advanced degrees. Uh, so it is, it's, the vast majority is that 80 or 85 percent isn't in the large law firm. But what you're saying is what, what everyone is overwhelmed with hearing is that 15 to 20 percent. It's just the numbers, you know. Those big numbers are easy to talk about and hope you're gonna, you know, maybe be one of the ones to grab that brass ring. Now, do, are people happy totally when they go to work for a large firm? Not any more than someone who decides to go to work for the county attorney's office. It's an individual thing. Some people adore it, some people don't, and they move on and they do something different. So what are the salaries like if you're in other things? Sure. If you're going to work, say, in government, mm -hmm. generally your starting salary is going to be almost anywhere is going to be thirty-nine to forty-two thousand. Uh, okay. Some cities will pay a little bit more because of um, cost of living differences. L.A., New York City, they're going to they're going to be a little bit higher, but that's that's going to be. That's going to be pretty average, 39 to 42. Now, some of the federal government positions, they are really starting to change their salary structures. Well, we're seeing a lot of the federal agencies bringing folks in in the low, low, as in like a 51, maybe a 52,000. And actually, we're seeing really a number of the city, Arizona city governments that are beginning to pay mid-40s up up to the 50s mm -hmm. in some cases. But your typical job, uh, the, the more typical job for a recent graduate mm -hmm. in government is um, the prosecuting attorney's office mm -hmm. and the public defender's office. Those are the ones that are going to be the uh, 39 to 42,000 mm -hmm. currently. And then how quickly does it rise or does it stay pretty steady? No, it'll be, uh, I would say in the government sector you move up probably five, six percent a year versus the private sector where you'll move up about ten percent a year. And what about a small firm in Tucson? What's the sort of, or the medium-sized firm in Tucson? That is so all over the board. It's, it's unbelievable. But uh, generally they're not going to start you less than what a new uh, prosecutor mm -hmm. is going to be. So you're going to be around that thirty-nine, forty thousand dollar figure and it could be up to sixty thousand. Mm -hmm. Depends on the firm, depends on what they do, mm -hmm. depends on what their client base is. Is their client base based in business that's a you know recurring uh, business or, or a retainer type mm -hmm. business? Uh, is it um, uh, personal injury where what you get paid depends on what you recover uh, from, from the accident. So it's very much across the board. But I, I will tell you, it's like 39, let's say, to 60. Mm -hmm. Would some fall in there somewhere? And it varies from city to city. Then there's some small boutiques that'll, boutique firms that'll pay like the big firms do. Not very many, but a few. Like what kind of firm would that be? I mean, what? what? Litigation, usually. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone that specializes in, in litigation or intellectual property mm -hmm. where they need someone who has a very specialized technical mm -hmm. degree. And so they're looking for such a small number of people who are graduating out of 40,000 who graduate every year nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a very small number are, are those IP technical people. And what about public interest? Is that 
public interest, it, it depends. We're, I've just posted one that's uh, uh, 17,000 uh, up in community legal services. A fellowship. Uh, yeah, a fellowship opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it can range all the way from, from 17 or 20,000 to, um, gosh, it can go up to the low to mid 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, Skadden Arps is a huge New York City firm. They have Skadden fellowships. Their salaries are in the thirty-eight to forty thousand uh, each year if you're a Scadden fellow and you go to work for a, you know, public interest group. So uh, I would say if you're talking average in mm -hmm. public interest, you're going to be somewhere in the high twenties to the mid thirties. Yeah, I would agree. And so, what does this all mean? I mean, you hear all these numbers, and yeah. what does this mean in terms of the quality of your life and yeah. your choices and what you do? And, and how does someone, how does a student who's never had any money, really? And they, I mean, they know their parents, but they may not even know how much their parents make. I mean, what does this mean? And, and you're choosing a lifestyle in many ways when you choose a job. How do you figure it all out? I think it means again uh, connecting with folks out working. You know, not to be afraid to talk about what kind of a lifestyle are you able to create as a public new public defender. You know, there are lots of folks who've done it all their lives. It's their passion. They do nothing else. They have kids. They have homes. They're raising families. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I think students need to uh, talk to people and, and find out, you know, and, and learn to distinguish between Maybe if you want to want to take a career that pays a little bit lower, distinguish between your needs and your wants, and really to determine maybe what your needs are. Something beyond the financial mm -hmm. and the physical, but you know what's what's going to inspire you and make you happy to go to your job every single day, and uh, you know it could, that can be as varied as the number of jobs that are available and the number of law students graduating to take them. Mm -hmm. You know the key is what number what makes you happy I mean that's the key everyone wants happiness uh, uh, health and enough money or maybe a lot of money uh, it's it just depends it's different for every single person and you don't have to stay at if you take that seventeen thousand dollar job working with homeless people in Phoenix for community legal services do you have to do that the rest of your life? No. You may decide to do it for a year and do something important and and then move on and do something else. So all of these things can be long-term, short-term. They can lead and lead you to uh, any number of other things. But it is. It's very difficult to, to decide. One of the things that we can do is work with you with it's one of the pluses about the University of Arizona. Uh, look at our tuition. Mm -hmm. It's a bargain. And it allows you to have those kind of opportunities mm -hmm. uh, to, to make some choices that are different. And also one of the things that we offer, you know, students get a chance to sit down and meet with, and you, this is one of the programs that we offer, you know, financial planners. And uh, with Kim Marlowe from Financial Aid to kind of talk about and help you figure out what is the minimum amount that you can afford, you know, to make right now based mm -hmm. on your bills and your, your loans and all of that? Uh, and then talk to you about, you know, keeping your standard of living at whatever level is going to be comfortable for you so you don't, you know, dig yourself into a hole of debt and then really have to look for one of the top paying jobs when that may not be what's best for you, what makes you feel good about using your career. So mm -hmm. it's just another way that we try to make sure that students have all the options mm -hmm. open to them, even considering, you know, the debt and the financial aspects. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about this? What about older students? And what about mm -hmm. students who have children? Are they limited in their choices? Um, I, I fit into both yeah. those categories when I went to law school. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think I am probably the youngest, uh, or no, I should, let me, let me just start that over. <laughs> uh, and I did fit into both categories, but I think I'm probably the oldest young lawyer of, of Arizona. It's, <laughs> it's something that the state bar offers to uh, new admittees. You're a young lawyer for the first five years that you've, you've been in practice or until you turn 35. And uh, single mom, I had a very young daughter in grade school. 
um, I think it did limit my options somewhat, but those were self-imposed limits. I spent my uh, second summer in Phoenix working for a big firm. It worked out well, you know, I was able to, with that salary, find daycare for my daughter, and, and I don't feel that I was uh, considered any differently by the employers. Um, it made me think a little bit about how I wanted to build my life after law school, what kind of time I wanted to be able to have with my daughter, and you know, kind of what working hours did I want to have. So, so, and you know, we'll find out what Mary thinks about it, but I think it does change your opportunities, but again, it changes them within the definition that you set for yourself based on how, how your goals are, are maybe different from someone who came into law school right after graduating. So let me follow that up. So if, let's say you adored the, I don't know if you did or not, the summer, the summer job, but you didn't like the fact that you had so many billable hours and it was really long. Um, do you think that you could have cut back so that you could have been in that environment doing the work but still had time for your, your daughter, or is that just not a possibility for people? That's something that comes up with students uh, every year, and we try to address in our programming by bringing a number of people in. Your question is, mm -hmm. can you balance your family and your career? Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer is, you can, I think, with some of the firms are more willing to allow you to do it, mm -hmm. but of course you may not be on a partnership track as You as may be a, on a permanent associate mm -hmm. uh, track so or something like that. There are always penalties for it in some Well, what, so what are you calling a penalty? I mean, well, again, I, it... Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying it in a, I mean, I guess I am saying it in a negative way, that there is, it seems like, well again, this is getting to the big salaries, and not everyone's a big salary, and, those, and mm -hmm. so I, I don't want to focus on that. But it just seems like when you finish law school, is your life always going to be, if you have little, little ones, like not grade school, are you destined to not see them until, I mean, it, are you <laughs> destined to always be at work? I mean, is there a way to sort of move your career and be very ambitious, have young children and still see them? Mm -hmm. Is that possible? And how, how do people do that? We have a number of young lawyers in Tucson who are doing that now who are job sharing uh, and and this is I know one person at the US Attorney's Office who's job sharing and job shared in her last position you know I know a number of newly married uh, folks who are in large law firms they're planning their families they're both attorneys um, and I think they plan on seeing their children while they're working their way through the firm you know it isn't necessarily that you get off the track in your firm but maybe you slow down for mm -hmm. for a little bit during those early child rearing years and then you know jump on and move again in government which again this is outside the realm of a large firm mm -hmm. one of the firms that I met with when I was in uh, DC this last week was the Internal Revenue Service they have child care in the building uh, you know parents work 40 hours a week and at any hours in excess of 40 you get comp time uh, you have maternity and paternity leave, so you know there are a number of legal employers who have benefits for folks with families. But but I think you've identified a, a big issue, which is how do you balance your life and your legal career? And do you see this as an issue? We've talked a lot about this with people, so I'm curious on your end. Um, do you see this as an issue only for women, or do you see the male students also concerned with this? I mean, is it still just a female space of how to deal with children, or is it are there the young men or older men or the students coming in with that are male also? Or is no one concerned about it? I mean, am I the only <laughs> one concerned about it? No. I continually am bringing this up in <laughs> interviews. <laughs> Maybe nobody cares. I don't I mean, know. Let, let me tell you, the <laughs> men uh, in the early 80s when, when I started doing this kind of business, they didn't care one bit. They didn't care if they ever went home. Uh, I, mean, that, I mean, it's not true personally, but from a work standpoint, you want me at work, I'm at work. Why? Because probably their wives were at home. And I think in since the early 80s to now, what, what have we seen? We've seen an incredible increase in divorce. So we have a huge number of single uh, parents, both male and female, mm -hmm. and an incredible number of two uh, but both uh, partners work, mm -hmm. 
And so it's just changed completely. And so what I see now is the men care just as much as the women. That's what I see. And I would agree. Uh, one of the big concerns, of, I, I don't think I've talked to a student yet who isn't concerned about a quality of life and finding a way to balance their personal life, which they intend to keep, with their legal career, which they're planning to start. And we're, we will start seeing a change, and we've already started seeing a little bit of a change in the larger firms. And I'll give you a, a, one kind of uh, interesting example. Look how many firms now are doing uh, casual dress, mm -hmm. uh, or business casual, in New York City, in LA. It's all part, and all of this is a reflection mm -hmm. with the, the younger people coming up who want this, who want some changes. And I think we're just in for a big change overall because they know they can't keep people if they don't allow time for families. Now, does that mean uh, you're going to be working 12 hours instead of 14 hours? Maybe. At the, at the big firm. But you may have to pay your dues more if, if for the first two or three years. Uh, so it's different for people who've got the small kids now. They have to make a little bit of a different choice. I think for the people who are going to plan their families in the future, they need to know that they need to, they, they need to pay their dues a little bit, usually mm -hmm. for three or four years. Mm -hmm. Then, you're a valuable part of the organization and they don't want to lose you. Interesting. Also, you know, I would tell whatever students who are out there in the class now who are saying, well, you know, I've got kids now, I don't know any attorneys in the community who are, as you say, balancing, mm -hmm. to come and talk to Mary or to me. And part of what we do is we'll put the students in touch with people who are doing it. Sure. And we'll have another program on it this year. And, and so, We'd encourage everybody who's kind of got that in the back of their mind, come and meet a whole panel of people that we're going to bring who have balanced family life in a number of different kinds of legal careers. Anybody who wants an individual meeting in an attorney's office or go to lunch with one or something like that, you just, all you need to do is come and ask because you, you've got a special. Do you think, I mean, do you think students should, I mean, that, that if you're here for three years, do you think you should at least have met or seen in one of these meetings, one or two? I mean, should you force yourself to say, I need to see, I need to meet <laughs> someone every year? Or, I mean, how important, how, how much do you want them to actually be in your office asking for this? I mean, should this be part of their, their homework? Oh, or no, should this I be an anomaly? I mean, when, when does this come up? Well, that's probably setting you up with somebody that, you know, in other words, we've got a really hard issue mm -hmm. that maybe we're dealing with that's beyond our scope, not many things of course, but, uh, <laughs> then, then, then you know that that's the way to go. And we'll have two or three of those a year. Mm -hmm. But if someone says, you know, I really want to work for a bank. I really want to be uh, in the trust department in a bank. I think that'd be a good, con I went to one of your programs. The programs are a gold mine. Mm -hmm. They are always, the lawyers who come and talk are among the best at what they do. They hand out their cards, they tell the students, don't hesitate to call. The, the programs are goldmine. If I were going to say one thing to do, besides coming in, letting us help you get prepared with the typical things, mm -hmm. resume, cover letter, and, and interviewing, that kind, come to the programs, come to as, as many of the programs as you can. All right, getting back to balancing, I just want to ask a couple more questions okay. about that. Uh, I want to say one thing too, okay. though. Uh, talking about should you try to meet uh, an attorney every year mm -hmm. or a couple of attorneys a year while, while you're in law school, you know, clearly your first priority is your studies, which happen here at the law school. Personally, I think it really is important. To, now, I didn't know any attorneys when I came here, so for me, I was very curious about what was going on out there beyond the law school. I think it really is important. These are people who are going to be your peers. Uh, and it's really nice from law school and feel that you already have some friends in the legal mm -hmm. community. You know, that's a whole group of attorneys who aren't going to be strangers mm -hmm. to you. And that's why we have the mentoring program for the first year students and why we bring all of these attorneys in 
for programming, and I can't tell you uh, how many people I already knew from programs that I remember meeting as a law student. And uh, I think it just broadens your world. Uh, don't do it and neglect your studies. It's kind of nice to get out of here and, and you know, put on different, uh, kind of a different persona than a student when you're, you're meeting people out in the legal community. It's, it's really refreshing and you learn a lot. And the Young Lawyers Division is fabulous in this town and we do, they co-sponsor lots of the programs that we put on just for that very reason. They want law students at any of their meetings, any of their fun after work, happy hours, anything along that line. Uh, so they're, and they're always willing to help. What if you're really shy? If you're really shy, we have a program to <laughs> teach students how to network. <laughs> Honestly, we do. Uh, you know, a lot of people are really shy. A lot of the attorneys that you're going to meet are really shy. So we actually have a program where we bring in a bunch of attorneys and we set up, you know, a little reception for everyone to learn to mix and mingle. And that's after we bring in, you know, some hams who never had a nervous moment in their life that kind of talk about how to walk up and meet and greet people. You know, as attorneys, you're going to have to learn to get out and meet meet folks and you know, your, your clients aren't going to say, gee, I really love my attorney, my attorney's so shy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, kind of something you're going to have to learn. So it's a safe environment here at the law school, and we try to make it easy to learn. You're not saying you're shy. <laughs> I'm not now, but I was when I... I remember when you first yeah. came. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you can learn. You can learn not to be shy. Mm -hmm. Very um, good thing to do. <laughs> All right, let me go back to the... Um, now, you, quiet and shy are two different things, you know. I used to be shy. Now, I, I don't know about... You probably I don't think I was shy. ever okay. shy. <laughs> I, mean, I just don't... I don't think I was. Yeah. I can remember being... I was stupid, learn. you know, and did some dumb things, but... Uh, where um, I should have been shy and quiet. Okay, back to the family. Um... <laughs> Back to the family stuff. Um, I worked for Professor Riviera, and I did um, the last year she was here, and I did. Uh, I was updating her files on sexual orientation law, which made me aware of many of the issues involved with that. What about same-sex partners um, in the workforce and having kids and all the issues with that? Is that something that students? How do they deal with that in terms of figuring out their employer? And it seems very bumpy. And is it bumpy, or are um, employers more reasonable about all of that? And, and do you get students that are worried about this, or is it, again, mm -hmm. am I just making up things that nobody cares? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, certainly, uh, uh, no. Students are, and I'm sure you've seen it too, but mm -hmm. students are absolutely um, concerned about it. If they're wondering, gee, do I come out in an interview? Mm -hmm. uh, how do I do that? What, what about the workplace? Uh, will I be able to bring my partner to the workplace? All of those, that is another area that has changed so dramatically in the last 18 years. Uh, it also depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. If you're in the heartland of America, uh, in a small town or a small firm, the approach may be one thing, and you're in Los Angeles or San Francisco, the approach is completely different. So what we do is talk about what's your comfort level, mm -hmm. number one. What are you trying to accomplish? And then, again, because of websites and written information, there's so much out there where people can see, gee, now National Association for Law Placement, we send out forms uh, every year to employers where how many of your associates are openly gay, how many of your partners are openly gay. If you see a firm of 100 people that has a goose egg in those two columns, I think you've got a pretty good idea mm -hmm. that uh, maybe people are not comfortable about coming out in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So, and again, that's a very individual thing, mm -hmm. and we sure have ways to put you in contact with people in different communities, as a matter of fact, to test out you also find uh, more 
state bar organizations are now, if they, if they haven't, appointing task forces to try to improve that issue, mm -hmm. to make employers more sensitized to the issue and to make the workplace more friendly. I'm on a, the Arizona Bar Task Force on those very issues, sexual orientation uh, issues, and three years old. So that's, it, I think Arizona is pretty typical of what most states um, uh, are doing mm -hmm. bar wise. And what about health issues or disabilities? What about that? Same uh, thing? Very, very interesting Timely question. Timely question. Timely question. Uh, the University of Arizona has a really a good-sized population of uh, disabled students. I'm, I'm just finding out, for instance, compared to ASU. Mm -hmm. I just talked to ASU's Career Services Director today because we're having, we have a subcommittee going on about hiring among the disabled uh, student population, which is, in my op opinion, abysmal within the private law firms. We are, we, I have seen in the last four, five, six years that, the, that uh, disabled students are not getting uh, hired by, it, especially private law firms. Government is, is not an issue. So we've pulled together really in, in the leaders within the legal community, the bar, judges, uh, within the law school, and uh, we're addressing the issues right now. And we're gonna hopefully have a bar task force that's gonna look at disability issues in hiring, and we're going to go out and educate uh, the Arizona bar. And we're gonna take it one step at a time. You know, we'll do it in Arizona, we maybe we'll take it on the road and, mm -hmm. and uh, do it nationwide with other bars. Let this be a, um, a model, mm -hmm. hopefully program for sensitizing the bar. The disabled student and recent graduate is at the place where women and minorities were not too many years ago, where the only job opportunities were in government and law firms weren't hiring. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting situation. Can I go back to ASU? And then I want you to say what you want to say. So I called <laughs> ASU and I said, have you been noticing this? And they said, no, we haven't noticed that. I said, well, how many disabled students do you, have you worked with this year? None. Well, how many are in your law school? Well, I don't think any right now. I said, you mean you don't have anybody in a wheelchair you have no one who's blind, no one who's deaf, no one who has other, you know, physical, visible, physical uh, disabilities. No, is, is what they said. So, um, that's shocking. It is shocking. Now, maybe they do, but they, as she said to me today, and I quote, and you don't, don't replay this for anybody, <laughs> okay, wait, but, wait. but the quote, that's, that's insane. Okay. Yes. Oh. But she said, in, uh, she doesn't think anybody, and I said, well, you mean just in the recent grant? No, in the entire law school. Oh. So, um, Terry Holford, she's a special woman. Yeah. She brings in a very diverse uh, population. So we have to be ready. We, you're right. We, uh, hopefully everyone is comfortable enough to come in and say, which... I, I've had come in and say, you're not doing anything for me, and we've got a big fat problem. Right. And that's why we ended up and being in that situation. And that's indicative, again, of the ability to work one-on-one -on -one with every student, depending on their needs. And what Mary and I are finding as we're beginning to work with this issue is the whole law school goes to bat to help us in finding really good, satisfying positions for these students who right now have a special problem that we found the legal community isn't addressing as they should. Now what about students who are um, uh, have ADD or have um, or health issues or mm -hmm. those sorts of things that don't make them as strong as your average student? How do they fare? fare? You know that's, that's interesting. I've got a couple of examples. Uh, several years ago a student who was um, some kind of LD issue, and I can't remember what it was. Excellent grades, um, 
going to work for a law firm over the major law firm over the summer and saying, what's going to happen? Am I going to be able to cut the mustard? Should I tell them? Should I not? I don't want to tell them. What it, and um, uh, I think what you'll find is what she found was she had had become so used to accommodations, mm -hmm. whatever they were, mm -hmm. uh, in her own life and and in studying in school, that she found ways to accommodate what she needed to do to make sure she was uh, doing what that firm wanted wanted her to do and to be performing at a very high level and end of the summer she had an offer for after graduation and she's still working for that law firm. So I mean that's one mm -hmm. example. And you know I can think of a student with a particular health issue that has caused uh, a, a delayed graduation period which is fine and is actually working to the student's benefit because she's getting some additional experience, has a fantastic resume. Uh, but I don't know, that's really the only those are, health related yeah, issues. Those are all things that we have to sit down and talk about mm -hmm. and say, well, what, what are the implications for you in the workforce, whether it's disabled or health issues or uh, LD issues. Mm -hmm. We sit down and, and let's talk about it and let's see well, here's what you can expect in a firm, here's what you can expect in a government mm -hmm. uh, situation, judicial clerkship, public interest. It's not a Are one... Are we answering your question? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. yeah. I think absolutely. It's, it's that there's not one approach that's going to work well for every student uh, and take into consideration their special needs. Mm -hmm. Rather, uh, you know, it's a health issue or a disability issue or, you know, balancing your family or the gamut of the kinds of situations that students bring in. I bet we're taking too long because no. there are two of us. No, it's great. I, I, we, we scheduled it. I hope you guys, is this okay with you guys to keep going for just a few more minutes? Edit, edit, edit. Yeah, no, this is great. That's why we booked it for, we booked it a longer one today. Oh, you did? We had lots of things to ask you. <laughs> okay. You can uh, see we don't have any problem chatting when students come in. <laughs> uh, yeah, see, this is, I mean, this is the same. <laughs> we do this, this, this is what we do for a living. There's no problem. <laughs> Um, okay, I want to switch gears a little bit, but that stuff is really helpful because I think basically what you're saying is you need to come, I mean, if students feel comfortable coming and talking to you about their concerns or their worries or their dreams or whatever, that you're sort of there to help facilitate. Right. And if that's fear about um, health issues or, or whatever it is, that, Just you know, don't, there is nothing that, that's why we have glass walls. And that's why we have doors too, though. That and are open. You just, well, and then and you come closed. in and we shut the door, <laughs> uh -huh. and, and you can. It's private. Tell yeah. us anything, in yeah. confidence. Yeah. We're both we're both lawyers, so we know about the cone of silence. We have a big <laughs> cone of silence. <laughs> <laughs> and when should students come in to start talking about this stuff with you? Mm -hmm. um, As a general rule, uh, first years need to really kind of concentrate on studies and, and just getting acclimated. But one of the best ways, and first years are invited to all the programming, and every year I'll bet a quarter at least of the people in the programs are first years. Mm -hmm. They just kind of want to get their feet wet. Mm -hmm. And then the next feet wetting stage is coming into the office and maybe saying, gee, show me a little bit. And one of the things that we do is we bring all the first years in in small groups mm -hmm. and give them a tour of the career services office and uh, so that they have that first initial passing through the door uh, to see what's there and learn what's in the library, just to break the ice. That's the reason we do it. Um, we're going to move on, and the last, uh, we may hopefully the last topic, I think we might think of some more, um, <laughs> is um, sort of the bridge between what you guys do in, um, with the lawyers and the, when they come, like all your, like the stuff in Washington, D.C., all the stuff that you do, the relationship with that and the student set stuff. But before we begin, I just wanted to see if Jerry, do you have, do you have any other questions on the stuff we've been talking nope. about? Can you think of anything else? Well, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're good. Yeah. You're a good interviewer. <laughs> You're very good. Well, thank you. So I'll keep going Not then. Career. <laughs> um, okay. We, you and I had talked about this before when I had said that we were going to set this up, and I can't quite remember what we talked about, so we'll just talk about it again. And okay. it's sort of um, what you guys do, what the students 
and the students are going to go out for the summer. They're going to, going to go out for a new job. There's kind of different parts to it. Sort of what the students do, what, what you do with the students in the sense of what should the students know about what's going on? What are they doing as a summer associate? And what should the employers be doing? And sort of what is your role between these two groups who don't really have any sense of what each other is supposed to be doing sometimes? <laughs> and sometimes they do. But sort of how does this whole system work, this sort of summer associate, beginning new jobs, that kind of, it's a whole big topic, but and I'm sure you guys have a better way to articulate it. But I think, um, I think let's talk about first year okay. uh, jobs, first summer okay. uh, jobs first, and I'm going to let Paula tell you about the uh, public service internship program that we have, because I think this kind of summarizes it. Nicely. Well, now, do you want all the details of no. how the program works, no. or, or really, I, I think the thing students should know is to check your boxes mm -hmm. and check your emails uh, for info from us, because mm -hmm. at the appropriate time, uh, what we're going to do is hold a series of informational meetings mm -hmm. about the work-study program, which is primarily for, for first-year students, second years. Uh, it'll be kind of late in the fall, but we'll send out flyers and send out emails and, you know, we always post notices outside our door. Uh, and what we're going to do is bring students in and we're going to walk them through the process step mm -hmm. by step. Uh, Mary does the same with the on-campus interviewing. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if students will just show up, mm -hmm. then we're going to spell everything out step by step and give them the information that they need, assisted by some programs mm -hmm. for how to succeed at your uh, summer position once you've landed it mm -hmm. and all of that. So right. I'll give you an example of a couple of uh, firms that are com going to be coming in. Mm -hmm. One firm's going to be coming in in August talking about what a, a day in the life of. Mm -hmm. And they're going to talk about, they're going to bring six lawyers in. This is new. Uh, Snell and Wilmer is going to bring in mm -hmm. six lawyers, seven lawyers. And they're going to be young lawyers mm -hmm. in different divisions, and they're going to say, here's what happens when I go to work every day. That's great. And uh, then another firm, uh, Brian Cave, is going to come and talk about how to succeed in interviews mm -hmm. with uh, the firms. Here's what the firms are looking for in your resume, in your cover letter. Here's what they're looking for in the interview process. And here's what they want you to be thinking about as far as later on mm -hmm. when they say where do you want to be in five years you know they're, they're going to give you so we do try to um, we do try to make those links in addition um, I mean through programs and, and you hearing it mm -hmm. you know from mouth but uh, we do mock interviews with the young lawyers division do you ever do one of I those? Did. Yeah. they're fun yeah you know, they're fun and uh -huh. they make a huge difference and scary i i i drag people in there kicking and screaming mm -hmm. uh to do them and uniform they say oh mm -hmm. my god i'm so glad i mm -hmm. i did it so mocking all of these practice things mm -hmm. you talk even about what what might you want to wear oh yeah for your we had a we had a whole summer. program just on dress. We had a fashion mm -hmm. show. Yeah, we did. We had a fashion yeah. show, and, and uh, uh, who does the free suit today or free suit? Ah, uh, that's Martha Finn. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's great. no, actually, we did is it. LW, uh, or is it LWA? No, it's uh, Arizona Women Lawyers Association does it in uh, conjunction with the uh, alumni office. Mm -hmm. They call it the Gap Program. Get attired professionally. Mm -hmm. And uh, there will be another one this year. Yeah, it's already it. collecting clothes. So, and then just the nitty gritty about, you know, when do you drop your resume? When do you start? And all those details. Mm -hmm. Clearly, informational sessions. Our responsibility is to do also the marketing and the outreach to the employers to get them interested in coming here, and and we're here to be that go-between between them. Um, and to say, an employer may call Paul or may call me and say, you know what, I need an electrical engineer. I need someone with an electrical engineering background. I don't know what to do. How can I get uh, So, So then always, always post to everybody. That's a rule that we do not violate. We post to everybody, but we do then 
some individual, mm -hmm. geez, this guy has mm -hmm. an electrical engineering degree. Mm -hmm. Let's call him mm -hmm. in case he isn't reading his emails. So, so, um, so what is, what's the whole point of all this in the sense of like, what are the, when you go to, when you, I did a, I did a summer clerkship, <laughs> it didn't seem quite clear either. I mean, each person, each person I worked with thought I was there for a different reason. Mm -hmm. Some thought I was just there for lunch. Yeah. Some thought I was yeah. I, I mean, you went to Las Vegas yes. for Quirky Quirk Products. Products. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that should be some. To you. <laughs> some. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you can do uh, that. Right. I was dying to yeah. ask where you went. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> some. I, and and you know what? Now that you now that I think back to what your original question was, that's what you were really asking. Right. Some firms have very planned programs, and they have training built in, and some government agencies. Let me give you an example, Maricopa County Attorney's Office. Incredible training programs throughout the summer, as well as clearly defined responsibilities for the supervising attorney. We're going to have to edit that because uh, we really are. Because uh, right now, well, they haven't instituted it yet. And we have a lot of students who are going to come back. Some students have had good experiences and some have not had. So I. Well, yeah, but you're always going to find that. Well, okay, I know. But, but anyway, I mean, it's not I understand. instituted yet. So right. But it's going to be instituted. Yeah, nah, yeah. All right. You might have a reaction from somebody and you okay. just don't want to spend it. It varies from firm to firm, from agency to agency. Some have training officials or planners who actually plan, or recruiting coordinators that actually plan out that kind of thing. Some firms are looking for a warm body. In, and people can assign work, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, do they want you? They wouldn't have recruited you to come work if they weren't thinking about mm -hmm. you possibly after graduation. Mm -hmm. But most lawyers and most law firms and government agencies, they work at such a fast pace mm -hmm. that unless an administrator who can kind of sit back and look at the overall view of what's happening, what's being assigned, What's the impact on you? It's all just a reaction. Every day is a reaction. So what if you get in, hypothetically, you get into a situation where you aren't, no, I mean, literally, someone home with you because you have to get this done. And then the next attorney says, how dare you take work home with you? You're not allowed to take work home. That you get, you get all these mixed messages. Sure. Or you don't have a perfect situation. You're being overworked. Mm -hmm. What do you mm -hmm. do? Because you feel like if you don't, if you say anything, they're going to hate you, and then mm -hmm. you're not going to get the job. Mm -hmm. Not even thinking whether you want the job sure. or not. So. Sure, sure. It's just life. It's just life. Just it is. Life. It's it's what you're going to find when you get out in the workplace, in probably fifty percent of the cases, mm -hmm. at minimum. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is an example of one place of what life is in the practice of law. If and just know that as a summer student, uh, clerk, law clerk, you're not going to be comfortable challenging, asking, or saying, oh, okay, but, but uh, that's part of what you're going to learn because the next summer, had you gone on somewhere else, I can't remember what you did. The, uh, um, I'm working at the University Attorney's Office. Yeah. You, do you now, after that year's, uh, that summer's experience, do you now uh, uh, listen differently, ask questions differently? So it's all part of the learning book. That's a nod yes, yes. for the jury, please. Yes. So you have to yes. speak aloud. Yes. Um, and that, I appreciate it far more than I probably would. <laughs> it's so it's all a part of the learning process is, is the whole point. Okay. And uh, so if you went back to that firm that we were talking about, uh -huh. where you were uncomfortable, you will handle it differently the next time. We're so, also getting... We are being more proactive and working with students before they go to an employer. That's what the Law 908 class was mm -hmm. all about for the work-study students this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, part of what you're learning here at law school is problem solving. Mm -hmm. And it can be uh, in an issue that has a legal context or it can be something that you've described. So part of what we are getting more active in is working with students to talk about how you can kind of deal with, with some of this slice of real life that Mary's talking about that you may get in the workplace that, that may not be ideal, you know, how can you go in and begin to kind of solve that problem without 
putting yourself at jeopardy for your, your whole mm -hmm. summer. So that's an area that we see that we're going to be able to explore and kind of expand our services. Um, what about, okay, we're going to do some more negative. Okay, what about um, <laughs> if you get there and you just hate it? It's like the second week and you think, if I have to go back one more day, I'm going to scream um, or murder someone. What do you do? Can you just stop? Do you have that situation? Call <laughs> Mary. <laughs> I mean, do you call career services and tell them? Or do you, I mean, what do you do? Well, what, here's, you what, here's what I as a student, and believe me, I've had it happen, calls and says it. Not often. I must tell you, it does not mm -hmm. happen often, but it'll, it, there'll be a couple of times. And it's not just a law firm, it can be a government agency too. Um, trying to get down to the real reason why they're not happy doing what it is. Mm -hmm. But here's the, here's the first rule. You've given a promise that you're going to go work for someone for a summer. You have a commitment. And in in a dangerous situation or something along that line, you're committed. It's a part of your responsibility as a professional. They, how would you like it if they said, you know what, we really don't like you. <laughs> and you know, why don't you just go on home? So it's, it's uh, the important thing is learning. Uh, this is all part of what you're learning. And so what we would try and do would be to talk you through it and say, look, you're going to be learning some valuable information. Uh, if you're not getting the assignment you want, here's how you could do it. Check back with me. Call me tomorrow. Call me the next day. Test this out. Try this. And we get you mm -hmm. into And then if, if we literally have to intervene with the employer, uh, we have done that before mm -hmm. too and said, look, we need to... This, this, uh, this student is not comfortable with the way things are going. Have you ever had the situation where the employer just says, oh, you Tough shouldn't shit. come back? <laughs> yeah, or, you know, we made a mistake, don't come back tomorrow. I mean, should students, I mean, that's another fear of like, somehow you're gonna be messed up and they're not gonna really want you the next day. I mean, is it, is it an audition? I mean, is it, I mean, It's an audition it? both ways, but you also both have a commitment to each other. It's a contract. Um, whether it's written or oral, it's, it's an agreement between two. But I will tell you this, in 15 years of being in this business, I've had it happen once from the employer's side. Mm -hmm. So, and that had some other things. It's not the norm either side. And I've only had three or four students in 15 years back out. Interesting. Now I think you have a, a good point. As a student working in a summer position with a firm or something, you know, sometimes you may feel you need a reality check. It's it's a really different kind of atmosphere, you know, especially in the large firms. It's just surreal at times. And, you know, you may feel like you need to communicate or you, you want some reassurance that what you've done is right or the way that you're performing is okay and it's not a problem to call and say you know hey I want to talk with you about how's my how my clerkships going mm -hmm. or I did such and such do you think I did well or was that the right way to respond so I mean you know you don't have to wait till the whole house is on fire <laughs> before you make a call if it's making you concerned and it's causing you not to be enjoying your clerkship as much as you think you might it's not a problem to and it I enjoy finding out how everything's going. You know, hey, how's your summer going? Well, great. You know, I love the projects I'm working on. You know, I've gotten to go out to client meetings. or it, It's not a bad thing. You don't have to feel like you've got a dire emergency before you call. You may just want a reality check, and that's okay. Do you ever get uh, issues of, we haven't actually talked about this with anyone, but one of the um, alumni suggested we talk about it, um, sexual harassment issues or sex semi-sexual harassment or situations mm -hmm. and do students bring that up with their summer employment or their new employment with you or mm -hmm. is that hard? Those hard areas, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, it happens. Mm -hmm. um, uh, absolutely, if anyone, and that's another thing, That's those are other types of programs that mm -hmm. we also fold into really in our interviewing mm -hmm. uh, program. We talk about, hey, 
what happens if you're asked these types of questions or, or uh, whatever. So hopefully we, we bring everybody kind of uh, to an understanding about basic, what the basic law is mm -hmm. um, in that particular. But if someone feels, I, I, I get, maybe I'm lucky or maybe no one's told me, but it rarely occurs had maybe two or three examples of that kind of thing that's not, oh, you know, you'll get used to it. I mean, it's <laughs> over, and, and it's going to end, and a phone call is going to be made uh, right then. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I'm saying if there's a, ever a dangerous situation or something mm -hmm. along that line, yeah. that's something that we take care of. Uh, that's one of those things that would be taken care of immediately. But hopefully... Our training sessions mm -hmm. help so that pe uh, we hopefully help people uh, be able uh, to handle those situations, at least on the initial. Uh, but we're there to step in. And the dean, too. Okay. That's particularly nice if you're going away all by yourself somewhere that you oh, don't you know. Absolutely. The sort of thought of like you're going to be on your own and you have no idea what's going to happen. Sure. You have a lifeline. You know. You know, the one thing that I've told some <laughs> students is, you know, you're never going to be able to get away from the College of Law. Yeah. You know, once you come, you, you, you are a part of the institution. And so, you know, if you're working in Dallas this summer and you need to call, call us. You know, and once you graduate, we'll still be outreaching. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you are a part of the, the family for all the resources that the law school has to offer. I, I'm constantly surprised at an email I'll get from a graduate that says, gee, uh, I, I don't know, can I still use your services? <laughs> or you may not remember me, but... Yeah, of course I remember you. You're yeah. from Pittsburgh and you, <laughs> whatever, and what are you doing now, you know? So, no, we... We remember you. But, you know, when you talk to people who are thinking about where to go uh, for law school, I think that's one of the things that, again, makes us unique. You know? Yeah, that, it's a very uh, positive. Very uh, supportive. Yeah, we're trying to be positive about all of the approaches that we take, even if it's about uh, that's not the, That's not the case uh, at other career services? Is, it, is how you approach it very different from many of them? Well, um, I would say it's different from some. I think it's the goal of, of a career services office mm -hmm. to to be that yeah. connected. That's the ideal. Uh, that's the ideal, and we are striving to be the ideal. Mm -hmm. And we're not just striving to strive. We're striving truly to be the best in the United States. Well, it's that's true. <laughs> it's true. It really we are. For a show. Someday we'll get there. Yeah. Do you have other questions? I'll be dead. But <laughs> all right, we got we've got two more questions. Okay. There's our dorky questions, but we have to ask them, <laughs> and you have to ask you have to answer them twice. Um, we ask people what their happiest moment is. Usually, a lot of times we have sad things happen. We have lots of things, but I want to know what your happiest moment was. We haven't talked about your careers outside Ever? of here. No, um, in the law and oh, in. Oh, I was gonna go. <laughs> um, in the law, I like you're in your practice. Today. And also in your, because you, we didn't talk much about your job outside of here, but I'm just curious, sort of, when you think about sort of when you were doing your previous job, what were your happy, happy moment, and what's your happy moment here? And they they vary, all they're all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we have been asking that sort of that's our only standard question. Okay. Okay. Happiest. That's a tough one. Um, because I've had, in, in, let's say in the practice. Okay. Um, working for a law firm, mm -hmm. and it was a litigation firm, mm -hmm. so I was, I, I really kind of handled the motion practice part of it, which, and mostly federal court. Well, the first time I went to federal court uh, for, uh, it was a motion, and they kicked it to a magistrate uh, to hear it. So the other firm, we're a small, we were a small firm, the other firm shows up, the entire table lined with six lawyers arguing this evidentiary motion and I am there for our firm. I mean the partner sent me and I just slaughtered them. And so that was a that's a memory that I have that uh, was fun uh, because we were right and they were wrong and there wasn't anything that they could argue 
that, uh, although I, I thought there might be, but by the time we were finished, so it was fun. I mean, that's one of those fun things where you go out whistling, you know, and you could have worked till 1 a.m. in the morning and you were so pumped up. Um, oh, in, in this job uh -huh. that I'm doing now, I have to tell you, I've had so because there are so many individual things that happen. I, I maybe the example of the student who is so shy that can't even look to people to speak, and uh, very bright. And I remember calling him. Do you mind, Bill? Not his name. Bill, do you mind coming in? So, uh, because I had a firm who'd said, you know, he's so bright, but he's so shy. And we talked about it a little bit, and literally, I saw a light bulb come on over his head. It's not the only time that that's happened, but a light bulb. He got it, and his whole persona changed. So there are such, you can say one thing that can sometimes make a difference. And that's, I have loads of times like that that, that happen. Um, and it's really, that's in this after 15 years because it's the best job there is. Very eloquent. Oh, <laughs> uh, really kind of the queen of delayed gratification. Uh, what's going to be my happiest moment for my previous job is going to come this August uh, when our researchers, uh, we have for, gosh, four years now in almost a cloak of secrecy uh, been a very research project. And by that I mean that uh, you know, we are filming jurors' discussions and deliberations. It has never been done in history, ever, except, you know, just slightly for a, an ABC uh, mm -hmm. special that was done in Maricopa. But for, for bona fide research, never. Yes, we will be releasing nationally and really to the world the results of this study, and it is going to rock the world. Uh, in, of jury researchers and social science. It's delayed, and you know, I left the court. I'm not going to be there when the, the announcement is made, but uh, that will be my happiest moment. <laughs> it's taken a while to come. And uh, Does it make you nervous or just excited? Or? Oh, I'm thrilled. I'm not nervous at all. Uh, you know, the few people who know it's coming, uh, it's, it's going to be the Tucson study. I don't know what we'll end up calling it, but you know, something Tucson, the Arizona courts, and, and it'll go down in history. So I think it's really important, and it, it was thrilling to be a part of it, and I just can't wait. So I'll be proud. But uh, here at the law school, I'm really not going to have an articulate description for you because it happens a lot. But I, I think, you know, we've had so many good successes in the Career Services Office, but honestly, in, and they are just bursting, or they're just shining, that they have just got, you know, the offer. And it, it could be for whatever, you know, someone going into government, firm, they've been trying to get a judicial clerkship, and they finally got one. And it, and it makes us all want to come gather just for a minute, because there is just such a whatever it was that they were going for. Yeah, it's like running out of the dugout for the home run. That's, that's very it satisfying. Happens. That's why it's a good, it, this is a great career. This is a great career <laughs> for people. It really is. Well, it's really interesting because um, we were talking about sort of repetition of what makes, what these happy moments are with different people. Mm -hmm. and, and Jerry had said um, yesterday that it was that people had thanked them. Oh, and that, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that a big lot difference of that, from the practice of yeah. law. But the yeah. other one was people who they they that one client came 
change their lives, mm -hmm. and that's what you s and then it made a huge difference in that person's life. And I guess that's really what your your job and all the stuff you do is that you just have such an impact on people's lives. We're making lives. little bitty changes. Yeah. Every day. And, and that's th that you're there to celebrate. Mm -hmm. You know that that moment. I mean, it's never going to be quite as good as that. I think you know after they tell their families or maybe one or two people. You know, a lot of students come to tell us. And to celebrate that moment, it's really exciting. And if they didn't come and tell us, it would be like, you know, you've read the whole novel except the last chapter. <laughs> and, you know, you're not going to know how it ends. So mm -hmm. when they come in, it, it's just kind of the culmination of everything mm -hmm. we've been doing. Mm -hmm. So you get your instant gratification mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been lovely. Do you have any other questions? No. Well, thank you. Oh, great. Much. This was fun. Thank you.